Selman and Fred Leader finishing their sets. It's time for us to get comfortable in our seats and prepare to hear a whale of a story as George Frayne presents Herman Melville. produced five sea books, though none as yet about whaling, when I got a letter from Richard Henry Dana. He had read my sea books, and he invited me to write about the whale and do for the whale fisheries what he had done for the merchant marine. You can read, I know, so you have read two years before the mass. It was many years ago that I read his book. And as I read, I felt bonded to him by, by a Siamese link and an affectionate bond. I swear, his chapters about Cape Horn were not written with a quill. <laughs> they were written with an icicle. I wrote to my English publisher, Richard Bentley, right after getting Dana's letter. I, I wrote that I proposed a romance of adventure founded upon certain wild legends of the southern sperm whale fisheries illustrated by my own experience of two years and more as a harpooner. I wrote in the country at my farmhouse near Pittsfield, Massachusetts. After the snow fell and I looked out the window it was as though I were looking out the porthole of a ship after the snow fell. And I awoke at night and heard, heard the wind shriek. I fancied there was too much sail on the house, and I'd better go up on the roof and rig in the chimney. The book I wrote there was Moby Dick. It is comedy and tragedy. It is comedy because, as I wrote, that that man who has anything bountifully laughable about him, you may be sure there's more to that man than you might think. For a laugh is a mighty good thing and rather scarce a good thing. It is tragedy because it is the unvarnished truth. Uh, tonight, I will tell you a portion of that story. Or rather, I will invite my narrator to tell that story. And you listen for my ideas why he tells his story. And afterwards, if you like, you, you can ask me some questions. Call me Ishmael. Whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and following up uh, the rear of every funeral procession I find, then I account it high time to get to sea and let the ocean 
do its magic in my soul. So it was. One dreary December, a Saturday night, I found myself in the city of New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, standing under the sign of the Spouter Inn, Peter Coffin, proprietor. Not a good omen for one about to go whaling. But I could tell from the shabby condition of the inn that it was one I could afford. So I went in and inquired of the proprietor of, for accommodation. We're full, he said. Oh, what you ain't any objection to sharing a harpooner's blanket, have you? Expect you're going whaling. You better get used to that sort of thing. Well, no man likes to sleep too to a bed when he can't sleep alone, but uh, I couldn't sleep in a bed tonight if I didn't share the harpooner's blanket. Oh, where is the harpooner landlord? I'd like to meet him before I agree to share his blanket. Oh, he's out selling his heads. His what? Uh, he's out selling his heads. He, he's just in from the South Seas with a whole string of shrunken heads. Uh, they're great curios, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, tomorrow is the Sabbath. I told him he'd better sell his heads tonight. It wouldn't do in a Christian village to be selling shrunken heads on the Sabbath. Well, that didn't endear me to the harpooner any. So I waited up for him, and I, I waited. And when he didn't come, and didn't come, I figured he had found another port for the night, and so I turned in. I was just about asleep when I heard footsteps in the hall and a light come in under the door. It opened, and in walked the harpooner, candle in hand. Such a face! It was covered all over with, with purple squares. I thought he'd been in a fight and had just come from the surgeon. He didn't notice me, went straight to the corner, and from his sea bag, he took out a small idol and a tomahawk. He put the idol in the empty fireplace, 